All right. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Officially, this is the Alchemy of Health. I'm going to share my screen. I think you'll still be able to see me in kind of a little box. Um, you might actually be able to move me around if, you, uh, if my slides get in the way. But I'm going to share my computer screen so you can see my slides. And the slides will also go hand in hand with the handout. Um, so you should be seeing my screen. So this is the Alchemy of Health, Five Principles for Extraordinary Health and Well-Being. I'm Morella DeVoe. I'm a counselor. I'm a hypnotherapist. I'm also a nutrition coach. And I have been working with these tools for some of them for two decades, and um, but professionally for over 12 years. And so today, again, I'm just gonna repeat this again. There's a handout with all these wonderful little blank spaces to help you take notes and make sure that you're uh, following along and getting the most out of this. So today we're gonna talk about what I call the four principles or of chemistry that are essential for vibrant health. So these are things that, uh, tangible things that you consume, that can um, that are fundamental to creating and maintaining optimal health. Then there's the number one most powerful principle that dictates whether you have good or bad health, and it has nothing to do with things that you eat. Um, so we're gonna dive into that today. We're also gonna, I wanna share with you one of my favorite stories about Anita Morjani and how she spontaneously healed from terminal cancer in essentially a matter of days. And I also wanna share with you all the fun that can be had with light and what are some interesting ways in which light can accelerate the process of healing. And you're also going to get to assess how all of this is showing up in your body and whether you have a handle of some of these things or there are some areas of opportunity for yourself. So before we dive in, I want to invite you to ask yourself, what's your intention? Why did you decide to show up on a Tuesday evening? What's your, what's your driver for being here? You know, is it that you're interested for your physical health? Is there something you're dealing with that you're looking for some answers? Um, is it just, uh, is it about the mind-body connection that you want to understand better? So just get clear on your intention and if there's something in particular that you're wanting to heal. So alchemy. What is alchemy? This is a word I've been a fan of for many years. So back in the day, initially, alchemy was the forerunner of chemistry. It was based on the supposed transformation of matter. Back in the 17th and 18th centuries, it was where alchemists were particularly concerned with attempting to convert base metals into gold. So they would want, they, they tried to turn lead into gold, for example. Another uh, definition of alchemy is a seemingly magical process of transformation, of creation or combination. And so as we take this word and apply it to the alchemy of health, so what we're looking to understand as alchemy of health is the actual transformation of your body, the pursuit of transforming poor health into what we might call the gold of optimal vibrant health. Or also we could call it the seemingly magical process of transforming health. And as I mentioned in the case of Anita Morjani, sometimes it can be quite magical. And it is absolutely alchemy. So I wanna start off the bat by saying that you absolutely have the power to shape physical matter. I have no question on this because physical matter starts with your body. And so the most immediate place where we know that you can shape physical matter is with your body. So you are, in fact, the conductor of what I call the symphony of your health. And what I'm going to share with you today is how you become kind of a deliberate conductor, how you are intentional in your creation of health, and that you have so many tools at hand in order to be a, a, an intentional, deliberate, conscious creator of your health. Because the reality is, whether you are conscious of it or not, 
you are in fact creating and directing the state of your health. So this is true whether you have good health or bad health. You are, you have far more power in creating what you're currently experiencing than you have perhaps realized or mastered yet. And so what I want for you is full on mastery of your health in so many dimensions. So I'm gonna walk you through the three elements that I have been using in the alchemy of health. We're gonna start with the alchemy of food, then we're gonna go into the alchemy of self, what I'm calling the alchemy of self, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about the alchemy of light, which is something I am deeply passionate about and I have never really talked about before. So let's dive right in, starting with the alchemy of food. So the first four principles that I'm gonna share with you on how you have power of creating extraordinary health for yourself are four principles that you can absolutely direct through food. And those four principles are, uh, the initials are D-D-I-M. So we're gonna start with principle number one. D is for detoxification. And detoxification in your body is essentially like your water treatment plant. It's like if your body is a city, you need to purify all of the waters in your city. And that, your water treatment plant in your body is your liver. So fundamentally, the liver has many, many, many functions. But one of the most important ones is really the filtration of all of your blood. And the liver is also kind of a, a chemical plant. So kind of in the water treatment uh, plant analogy, you know, it's like purifiers are put into the water and maybe, you know, in some cases, uh, minerals and you know things are removed from the water and that's exactly what the liver does the liver will put in nutrients will put in hormones into the blood but will also extract uh, toxins from the blood and so if the liver gets congested which in our modern life it often does then detoxification doesn't happen and uh, or doesn't happen uh, effectively and so disease increases. In my case, as many of you know, I had severe cystic acne and hormone problems and it all began with a congested liver. So how we boost this principle for healing is boosting our uh, detoxification pathways. The, the five ways, I think it's five, five or six, in the, the five essential elements or ways in which you boost your, liver, your liver's ability to detoxify is first and foremost through chlorophyll, anything that's green, anything from broccoli to um, spinach, chard, and things like uh, seaweeds and um, sea algaes like chlorella and spirulina. So, Chlorophyll has a profound liver cleansing and blood cleansing effect. It's also an oxi it, it helps oxygenate the blood. It helps build hemoglobin. So chlorophyll is going to be the first agent in which you're going to start to boost your liver's your body's ability to detoxify. Then of course we've got water. The more water you drink, clean, good quality water, the more you're going to help to kind of flush things out. Then we go into lemons and limes, and there's several aspects about lemons and limes, not only because of their vitamin C, which is extraordinarily important, but also because of uh, their bitter flavor. So they're gonna stimulate the liver, but the vitamin C in particular, and not just in lemons and limes, but natural vitamin C from vegetables and fruit is going to activate or enable what we call the path to um, Eliminate de detoxification, uh, the second pathway of detoxification in the liver, which is when the liver converts toxins that it's filtering out of the blood into compounds that are safe for removal from the body. So we absolutely need vitamin C in order to effectively detoxify. Then we've got bitter herbs, things like dandelion and burdock root and milk thistle and alfalfa. Bitter herbs are liver tonics. They're going to stimulate liver function, and they're going to particularly stimulate the production of bile and the secretion of bile. And the liver flushes out when you, and I'm going to hit uh, the, um, the next one as well, because 
bitter herbs will stimulate the production of bile and then healthy oils you know eating plenty of good fats like avocados and olive oil olives and coconut oil and grass-fed butter all of in uh, fish and omega-3s all of these really healthy oils are going to require bile for you know to, to digest them uh, one of the primary roles of bile is to emulsify fats and so when you eat a healthy amount of fats the liver and the gallbladder secrete bile and in that secretion of bile there's also uh, a, an, a, a, an a kind of a basic detoxification of the liver because the liver flushes out into the colon and so if your colon is moving along well then some of those toxins that are secreted along with the bile um, are also eliminated. So bitter herbs will help that and eating healthy oils will help that. In fact, one many, many uh, detoxification programs include um, or call for taking a tablespoon or more of olive oil just before bed because taking that fat just essentially kind of squeezes the, the liver out a little bit and it aids in detoxification. And then finally, the liver loves warmth. The liver does not like uh, icy cold water, uh, ice cream, cold temperatures, nor necessarily things that are super hot. But you know, room temperature water, warm water, uh, warm foods. The liver, the liver does really well with those foods. All right. So moving on to principle number two, the second D is for digestion. Obviously, none of us can thrive in life without a strong digestive system. And I equate the digestive system to the solar power or the solar panel, excuse me, in your body. You know, a solar panel on your house will convert solar energy into energy that you can use to heat your house, to heat your water, uh, to charge your car. So the digestive system in your body is also your energy converter. It converts chemical energy into the energy that you can use for thinking, for you know, running, and for all of the uh, processes in your body. And the ways in which you boost digestion, because all of us, as you know, life progresses, we start to lose digestive strength. So we all need to actively work on our digestive system, support our digestive system for optimal health. Because again, if we don't have a strong digestive system, we cannot absorb the nutrients that are necessary to heal. Anything you need to heal, you're gonna need strong digestion. So it begins with enzymes. And enzymes start in your mouth when you're chewing your food. So Chewing your food is the very first and perhaps most important deliberate action you can take to strengthen your digestion. Of course, there are enzymes also present in raw and fermented foods like sauerkraut, uh, yogurt, naturally fermented pickles, kimchi, that sort of thing. And enzymes are really, really potent agents to support digestion. In fact, if you have um, in digestion, you can take digestive enzymes and you'll feel how everything starts to move through. The second step that you need to support is healthy stomach acid. Your stomach is meant to be very acidic. In fact, things like osteoporosis begins when stomach acid weakens because we need strong stomach acid in order to absorb calcium and fix calcium into our bones. The problem is when the acid, acid seeps out from the stomach up into the esophagus. But if the stomach is healthy, it keeps all of that acid in. And sea salt is actually a precursor for the stomach to build strong stomach acid. Uh, sea salt essentially is hydrochloric acid. I'm sorry, um, no, uh, sodium chloride. It's the chloride that helps the stomach create hydrochloric acid. Um, or a, an element for the stomach to produce hydrochloric acid. Then there are things like lemon and apple cider vinegar, obviously acidic, that when you uh, take them with food, they can help to strengthen your stomach's uh, acid levels so that you can digest your food. The next level is bile, as we mentioned, with the liver, so eating bitter foods, uh, and healthy fats, as we mentioned before, with detoxification is also supportive of digestion. And then flora, you've heard of probiotics, but the number one source of probiotics is naturally fermented foods. And the number one source of prebiotics, prebiotics are the food that your intestinal flora eats, 
is fiber. Green leafy vegetables, mushrooms, cucumbers, eating vegetables is the best way to feed your healthy intestinal bacteria. So these are the basics for boosting these absolute principles. Um, principle number one of detoxification, principle number two, digestion. The third principle is I is for inflammation control. So inflammation gets a little bit more complex because it isn't one single organ or one single place. Inflammation control is what I like to equate as the doctors and architects of your body. These are all the cells, the immune system cells. There's also elements inside every single cell of your body. Mast cells, for example, are the cells that are generated when there's an allergy attack, when there's a histamine reaction. White blood cells are part of the inflammation response um, to fight an infection or a twisted knee. So inflammation is essentially the healing and repairing response of your body in action. We hear of inflammation as something that is bad because what a lot of times happen is that inflammation is kind of running out of control. High cholesterol is an example of inflammation that's running out of control that hasn't been managed. And so you can imagine if inflammation just, you know, if you have all of this, all of these doctors and architects flooding the streets, everybody, you know, out trying to save the day. There's so many out there that, you know, they start bumping elbows with each other and not actually being very effective. So what we need is a balanced, controlled inflammation reaction where just enough of inflammatory agents are released, they do their jobs, and then they retreat. They go back home, they go rest. They're not, they don't stay overly active as in the case of autoimmune conditions. So the precursor to an autoimmune condition is actually rampant inflammation. So how do we manage inflammation? Primary anti-inflammatory agents First of all, is the colors of nature. We already talked about green, but then there's purples, oranges, blues, reds. Every pigment in nature, this is how nature tells you that this is a good thing for you to eat. Every pigment in nature is going to be an anti-inflammatory substance. This is why, you know, the pigment in red wine can be uh, a positive thing. The, the downside of the red wine, of course, is the alcohol. So you, you can get the pigments without the alcohol. Then there's fiber. Um, fiber, uh, non-soluble fiber will be kind of a sweeping action through your, your colon, which is a great thing. Um, and that obviously will help um, the, the way in which that helps with the inflammation pictures, obviously it helps boost your intestinal flora. And that is another aspect of your intestinal flora is that it does have an anti-inflammatory effect. Uh, uh, you know, so where your immune system begins is in your intestinal flora. But then there's also non-soluble fiber, things like beta-glucan in, in the fiber of oats, for example, that's proven to lower the inflammation related to high cholesterol. So fiber will, even though we don't exactly understand all of the pathways in which it happens, but eating more fiber ends up lowering cholesterol, not because the, the fiber is going into your, your blood cells, but because of the anti-inflammatory action that fiber has. Then we have omega-3 fats, which are you know, the king of anti-inflammatory uh, fats, anti, almost anti-inflammatory substances. In fact, I believe that in a big way, our modern lifestyle is highly pro-inflammatory because we're not getting enough omega-3 fats. And omega-3 fats is fish oil from wild-caught fish, uh, not from farm-raised salmon or tilapia, no omega-3 uh, fats in that, but also flaxseed and walnuts and hemp seeds. Um, so increasing omega-3 fats is a powerful anti-inflammatory agent. And spices, turmeric is an extraordinary anti-inflammatory spice, as are many others, uh, garlic as well. So these are uh, some of the most powerful ones. And then enzymes as well, not just because of the aid in digestion, but also because enzymes, uh, there are some enzymes in particular that are called proteolytic enzymes that help to reduce inflammation by 
almost like digesting rogue proteins that are creating mucus, that are creating congestion throughout the body. So very well documented how taking proteolytic enzymes away from meals is a powerful way to reduce inflammation. All right, so moving on to principle number four is M. M is for metabolic optimization. And in your body, your metabolism is hard, is also a hard one to pinpoint to one spot because your engines are every well, everywhere in every single cell of your body. So your metabolism is the overall speed and heat of the engines in your body, and those engines are the mitochondria in every single one of your cells, those little kind of squiggly things inside every single cell of your body. This is the part of the cell that burns energy to give fuel to the cell so that the cell can do the job it's supposed to do. So whether it's a brain cell or a, a lung cell or a stomach cell, the mitochondria are there to convert the energy so that cell can do what it's meant to do. And um, there's also uh, a couple hormones involved in, in your metabolism and whether you're burning sugar for fuel, which is the case of insulin, or whether you're burning fat for fuel, which is the case of glucagon. So these hormones have a lot to do with optimizing your metabolism and being an efficient fat burner. Um, so what are some of the things that help you metabolize, um, opt excuse me, optimize your metabolism? Number one is eating real food, real food um, from nature, not processed foods, not Twinkies, not, um, you know, Wonder Bread, but real food, um, you know, from your garden in season, um, things that you could have potentially farmed, hunted, or fished for is what helps you return to a a more natural rhythm in your metabolism. Once we start to move away from nature and eat processed foods, we start to kind of disconnect between our food and the, the natural conversation that exists between food and the body. Eating with your intuition. And so again, if you're eating more locally, more in season, more real food, then you start to have a better sense for what your body is needing. When we eat too much processed food, we start having severe cravings for more processed foods, more pastas, more cookies, more chips, more uh, donuts and bagels, more ice cream. And so we lose the connection with our bodies and what our bodies need. But when we eat real food, we can more easily perceive, oh, I'm, need I'm eating a salad. I'm eating some green veggies. Or you know what? I'm, I'm craving a piece of steak because I haven't had some significant protein or fat in a while. And the other piece of metabolic optimization is returning to the ancestral wiring of how we're meant to eat, which is not actually eating three meals and two snacks a day, eating every two hours. There's this uh, perception that is very much um, still hammered by the dieting industry that if you eat every two hours, you're going to keep your metabolism running and you know, you're going to burn more calories. But that is essentially like running your engine in red all the time. If you run your engine in red in your car all the time, you're going to burn that engine quicker. And the same thing happens for your body. You're also going to stay on a high insulin curve, which means your body's going to need sugar for fuel and not going to very effectively burn fat for fuel. The ancestral way of eating is... <laughs> if you're a hunter-gatherer, you go hunting, you've got food. Then you go a few hours or a few days and you may not have food. So we're not going to fast for days at a time, but we do need to fast for a few hours every day, you know, fast 12 hours or more overnight. And w the new research on intermittent fasting, which means seeking to fast at a very minimum 12 hours overnight and moving towards fasting maybe 14, 16, 17 hours so that you're eating more of a brunch as your first meal and then you know eating again before sunset thereabouts. So when you start to find that you can eat real food, eat intuitively, 
you can start, you will naturally move into a more natural, ancestral, intermittent eating way of living, which is also correlated with longevity. All right, so I'm gonna switch this so that you can assess yourself. So we're gonna, if you flip the page on your self-assessment, what you're gonna do is count how many of these signs of uh, a congested liver or a congested water treatment plant you might have. So of all of these things here, just count how many of them do you have? You can just use your fingers. Do you have allergies, headaches, sensitivities to smells, sensitivities to foods or sulfites, animal dander, pollen, mold? Do you have skin problems? Do you have aches and pains? Do you have an autoimmune condition? Do you live or work in a congested urban area or in a tight building? Do you take any prescription medication or over-the-counter medication, things like Tylenol and antihistamines and Advil and um, acid blockers or um, you know, Pepsid or Tums? Any of these will count in each one of those. You use a different finger. Do you eat high fructose corn syrup or drink a lot of alcohol or a lot of sugar it would also uh, congest the liver or eat hydrogenated oils? So count how many of these and write that number in your handout. The next one is assessing how many signs of a faulty solar panel you might have. How much is your digestion asking for help? So check, how many of these do you have? Do you tend to suffer indigestion, heartburn, acid reflux, or constipation? Maybe alternating constipation and diarrhea. How about bloating or you know, pains in your stomach, spasms? Also signs of a weak digestion are skin problems and joint problems, mood issues as well, and mental fog. Having, of course, having food intolerances or allergies is a sign of faulty or weak digestion that needs some support. Again, taking any sort of uh, over-the-counter uh, medication, but especially if you have ever taken antibiotics, if you've ever taken steroid meds, if you've ever taken birth control or NSAIDs, you know, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen, all of these affect the digestive system in one way or another. And anybody who's been on a course of antibiotics uh, absolutely needs to work on their intestinal flora, even if it's been years after you took antibiotics. Do you eat GMO foods? Those pesticides and GMOs are also killing off your intestinal bacteria. Do you drink fluoridated water, uh, chlorinated water? Do you eat a lot of sugar, alcohol, refined foods, or a lot of bread? Each one of these counts as one point, so count how many you have here and give yourself you know, kind of a rough number on these. And then how many signs of inflammation do you have? You know, do you have some, some doctors on strike not doing their job and then going home? So there's not effective healing taking place in your body. So signs of inflammation are allergies, any sort of allergies, environmental allergies, skin allergies, food allergies. Do you have skin problems? It's also, you know, again, I'm the former acne sufferer. It was all about liver congestion, a leaky gut, digestive system that wasn't working, and inflammation. Perfect storm for acne. Um, inflammation, liver congestion, perfect storm for high cholesterol and um, heart disease. So high cholesterol or heart disease are also issues of inflammation, diabetes and obesity also all about inflammation. And of course, then there are things like IBS is inflammation in your digestive tract, ulcers also inflammation. And interestingly, if you have crowns, if you've had root canals or cavities, these are all considered to be chronic inflammation in the mouth. And so anybody who has had uh, significant dental work needs to very actively work on anti-inflammatory um, support for your body um, and especially in your mouth. At some point I might do a class just on oral health and reducing inflammation in the mouth. And then having autoimmune conditions or history of cancer is also uh, related to inflammation. And anything that's hot, red, 
sweaty, hot flashes, all of these are not necessarily things that you would have thought are related to an inflammation, but they are. So count them out, give yourself a number. Again, this is your body telling you clearly what's going on. And so your body communicates all the time. It's always telling you what it needs and you have the tools to address it. So the next self-assessment is about your metabolism. Do you have signs of weak engines in your cells? Do you have trouble losing weight and keeping it off? Have you struggled with obesity or yo-yo dieting? Um, do you have diabetes or pre-diabetes? These are metabolic issues as well as inflammatory issues. Do you have chronic fatigue and even depression? Chronic fatigue and depression can go hand in hand and depression can also be a metabolic issue. Um, depression, in fact, has everything to do with digestive health and metabolic strength. Do you have thyroid issues? Do you have a history of, of dieting? Do you have a history of emotional eating? And do you eat a lot of high sugar, refined foods, alcohol, carbs, all of those things are gonna be very hard and taxing on your metabolism. So again, give yourself a number. And so all of these, as I said, are signs that your body is giving you. But in a nutshell, Every food has a frequency, and so you can use the information and just the, the awareness, because it doesn't take rocket science. You know, The frequency that a food carries is the consciousness that created it. So the consciousness that created the berries on the left is not the same consciousness that created the Twinkies on the right. And that does not take a degree in nutrition or science to know that these things are different and that the effect is going to be different and that the frequency in this, these foods are going to be different. So you get to pick. You get to use your intuition. You get to eat close to nature and you get to apply some of these things to boost these four principles in your body. And if you need help, I have a six month program called Vibrant Body Thriving Life. It's open enrollment all the time. And the minute you decide to start is the minute that the program starts for you and you get live support from me. You get 24 weekly modules that guide you through these four principles step by step. Guide you through a detoxification process. They guide you to build your digestive system. Then we work on lowering inflammation and boosting your metabolism. And it's a really, really extraordinary program where people have gotten off meds, reversed diabetes, gotten off their um, cholesterol meds, reversed their IBS and all that good stuff. So if your body's telling you, I really need some support and you feel like you need more, then reach out and I'd be happy to tell you more about this program. But let's move on because I wanna move into something that is even bigger than food. This is where things get really juicy. And even though I have mastered food for health and I have been teaching people how to use food to activate healing in their body and get off meds for over 12 years. My juice where I am really, really, really good at is in this thing that I call the alchemy of self. And I was, <laughs> I was looking for a woman to put on this picture um, because of course I'm a woman, but I just found this beautiful man meditating and I thought, you know what? He Encapture, encapsulates, he captures the energy of what I want to convey. Because this, the alchemy of self, is way more powerful than anything that you could be eating. And so let's dive into this. So, principle number five your overall state of being is what shapes your health above anything else, even above your food. You can start with your food and it's going to give you that sense of agency, that sense of noticing your body shifting, but ultimately it comes down to who you are being, who you are in the world that is radiating through every cell in your body. And it's not just from your conscious thoughts. So what is your overall state of being shaped by? First of all, it comes from your temperament or your personality, you know, whether you're a yellow lab or a Doberman or a Chihuahua, you're kind of born with a certain temperament, a certain personality that comes from your family, from your ancestry, from your encoding. So you're kind of born with it already. 
Then we also add onto that all of the programs and memories, you know, from the moment we were born and sometimes even before that. So whether they're good or bad memories or good or bad programs, they shape who we are. Then we have all the thoughts and beliefs that we have, whether they're conscious thoughts or in the majority of cases, the subconscious ones. And then the emotions that we have, the, the emotions that we are the majority of the time and even the ones you know, that we fluctuate through. So I'm gonna walk you now through how all of these things show up in your body and what you can do about it. But before we do that, I wanna tell you about the science that proves that your state of being, your thoughts, your emotions shape your health. We start with epigenetics. This is the cover of Time magazine from January 2010, where they said, you, why your DNA isn't your destiny. The new science of epigenetics reveals how the choices you make can change your genes and those of your kids. Essentially, genes do not determine your health. It's the cell environment that determines how genes express themselves. And what determines that cell environment? Well, it's food. It's toxins, so we talked already about the alchemy of food that can help with the food and the toxins, but it's also the thoughts and the emotions. And the first person to document this, oh, before we move on, so your genes are not your fate. Your genes do not determine your fate. I have the gene for high cholesterol. I have the gene for diabetes. Um, I have the gene for dementia. I don't have chol high cholesterol. I don't have diabetes. And I'm doing a pretty good job at warding off dementia with my lifestyle choices. But the very first person to document that thoughts and emotions do in fact shape the cell was Bruce Lipton who is a molecular biologist. I had the honor and privilege of interviewing him on my show about a month ago. Um, you can find that on my website. He's extraordinary. And he wrote his first book was The Biology of Belief. It's a fabulous book where he explains in minute detail how exactly it is that your thoughts and your emotions shape your cells, how they show up in your cells and how they affect gene expression. But beyond epigenetics and molecular biology, we also have psychoneuroimmunology. This is where psychologists teamed up with neurologists and they teamed up with immunologists and they began studying how thoughts can very actively direct the way your immune system behaves. And one of the most fascinating pieces of research they did was that they took two groups of cancer patients, they split them up, one group was sent to meditate, they took their blood before and after the meditation, and this group just went and did a half hour meditation. The other group, they took blood before and after, and instead of doing just a general, you know, peaceful meditation, they gave them a visualization. And in this visualization, they said, all right, immune system, you're gonna do A, B, and C. You're gonna multiply your T cells, and you're gonna multiply and increase your uh, natural killer cells, and your lymphocytes, and all of these things. And so they measured blood, blood count, white blood cell count before and after the meditation. And both groups improved. But the group that was visualizing the immune system doing what they told the immune system to do actually had significantly higher immune system markers. In other words, the immune system was listening. Your cells are listening to what you think about. So if you wanna start healing, one of the things you can start doing is start visualizing the healing happen. Imagine that you are directing your cells to do the things that you need them to do. So psychoneuroimmunology has proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that your cells are listening. And then finally, quantum physics. This is my favorite. Quantum physics is, you know, since the days of Einstein, has been telling us that matter is an illusion, that all of these things that you see around you that seem solid and real, they're just an illusion because all of it is really just one field of energy. It's all energy and motion. And interestingly, in some of the most fascinating um, experiments in quantum physics is where they try to determine whether uh, you know, a, a molecule, <laughs> a, a, 
a particle, before it actually becomes a particle, is it going to be a particle or is it going to be a wave? And I'm not a quantum physics to know the, the perfect terminology. But the fact is that in these experiments, what they're proving is the observer of the experiment shapes the field, shapes the, the outcome of the experiment. What the observer is expecting to see is what they will see in these quantum physics experiments. And so what Einstein began saying back then, and we've kind of forgotten about that, but what Einstein began saying is, we are the shapers of the field. We are shaping everything around us, beginning with our physical bodies, through the, the, the program that we are. And our we'll, we'll get into programs in a minute. So the observer shapes the field, which in your health means essentially what we're saying is your thoughts shape your health. Your thoughts shape your health. But the thing is, it's not your conscious thoughts for the most part that are shaping your health. Because as a hypnotherapist, I can tell you that 92% of your mind is unconscious. Only about 8% of your mind is the conscious mind where you have your logic, your reason, your ability to make decisions, to check things off your to-do list, your willpower where you go on a new diet that only lasts about a couple weeks because 92% of your mind is subconscious and it's filled with all of your patterns, all of your beliefs, all of the habits, the emotions and memories, the infinite ways in which you've been doing things since you were about eight years old and that you've just been strengthening those patterns over time. So 92% of your mind is subconscious. So essentially the bulk of the thoughts that are shaping your health are subconscious. And so in order to continue to illustrate how this happens, how your cells are listening, how this is all moving through you, I like to use um, a metaphor of a musical instrument. So. If you imagine yourself like a violin, I played the piano for 10 years, so I kind of like thinking of the piano, but you can think of the programs in your subconscious, the beliefs, the, the thoughts in your subconscious as the sheet music. And so they're there, they're already programmed, and all you pretty much are doing is playing the music that's there. So the thought is like the playing of the note, you know, striking the chord on the piano or taking the, the bow and, you know, moving it across the strings. That is the thought. It's like striking that chord, setting an emotion. And just like music, thought are electromagnetic waves. You know, this is also something that quantum physics has shown us that, the bulk of the universe are these electromagnetic waves that we can't see or hear, but they're there or feel. But music is an electromagnetic wave that we can hear. Thoughts are also an electromagnetic wave. We can't hear it. We can't see music. We can't see thought. We can hear music because those electromagnetic waves are perceptible, perceptible by our ears. So the electromagnetic waves of thought the way you perceive them is through emotion. You feel the vibration of your thoughts. You can hear the vibration of music, but you can feel the vibration of thought. And it's because they're a different frequency. The frequency of music you can hear, the frequency of thought you can feel. And your thoughts are, you know, just think about how your thoughts are electromagnetic waves that are measurable. There are instruments, as you know, that measure your electromagnetic waves. Those waves are being released into the field. So they're, you know, bumping up against everything around. They're bumping up against your spouse and your children and your coworkers and your electromagnetics. And so, yes, your thoughts are also going to affect your electromagnetics and vice versa. So, We've got programmed, already written sheet music. And so what happens is that, you know, we end up being pretty much a music box, a little merry-go-round, around, 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 playing the same music over and over and over and over and over, pretty much with the same mood, the same thoughts repeated over and over and over. And, you know, the little horsies go up and down, up and down, around, around, around. So it seems as though things change, but overall, it is the same program. It is the same state of being. The good news is you can change it, but the question you might want to ask yourself is what's your music like? 
Are you creating music for vibrant, glowing, amazing, extraordinary health? Or are you creating music that um, lowers your vibration, lowers your frequency? We're going to look at the look at frequencies in a minute. So the alchemy of self is about changing the tune of your symphony, changing that music that is reverberating in every single cell of your body and shaping your cells. And so the way we go about this, you can begin with your thoughts. And the first way in which you can start shifting your thoughts is through the use of affirmations, right? Louise Hay is famous for affirmations and the healing power of affirmations. But the challenge is that affirmations are coming only from that 8% of your conscious mind. 8 to 10% if you're, you know, super developed and you 10% of your mind is conscious. So you can't very quickly shift 92% of your mind with just that 8% using your affirmations because that 8% is also preoccupied with picking up your kids from school and grocery shopping and the things you have to do for work and all of that good stuff that's in your conscious mind. So affirmations are helpful. They can start to shift your thoughts. And as you shift your thoughts, the next step is that you can also start to have an impact on your feelings. As you shift thought, and you start to have more positive thought, you start to have more positive feelings. But even more deeply, you can also work on shifting the emotional patterns that you might hold. And this is where I've gotten really good at working with my clients and helping them shift, say, patterns of anxiety or patterns of depression or patterns of pessimism. You know, when you can start to work directly on this kind of program of just striking the same note, the same emotional note over and over and over and over. We can shift that. You can take it from me. I'm a recovering pessimist. And so I have been able to shift out of the kind of the chronic pre-programmed pessimism that I was born and raised with and become increasingly a more positive, more optimistic, more, you know, finding the blessings in life kind of a person. And frankly, it's a lot more pleasant. The other piece about healing, uh, shifting he uh, feelings and that mood inside your, your music box and in, in the symphony of your being is healing wounds from past experiences. You know, the traumatic experiences, you know, losing your, your job or a traumatic divorce or losing a loved one that can be, you know, really affect you and kind of, um, you know, you might have a before and after where before you were kind of happy go lucky. And then after this happened, after you were mugged or robbed at gunpoint, then, you know, you're all of a sudden a very anxious person. I'm going to take a sip of water for a moment. My water with a little bit of, uh, non-sweetened cranberry Cranberry juice, um, great for the liver and great for the kidneys. So at a deeper level, as we're working on the alchemy of self, below thoughts and feelings are these encoded beliefs, many of which are invisible to us. And so the beliefs that uh, we carry are beliefs that come from, um, you know, our ancestral um, programming from our family experiences, from our parents' experiences. And so it takes rewiring these beliefs, you know, beliefs like, um, you know, life is hard or life is full of toil and suffering or money doesn't grow on trees and it takes hard work. Or, um, you know, some people, these aren't necessarily uh, beliefs that you want to change, but, you know, some people have the belief that, you know, they make money really easily or that relationships come easily to them. Or, you know, that's another belief that marriage is hard and um, full of challenges, right? Or the belief that health just deteriorates with age. And, you know, beliefs like in my family, we all suffer from what fill in the blank. So all of these are beliefs that you can rewrite. And, um, you know, they can be more pervasive than just, you know, your transient passing thoughts. Then um, on another level, I see a raised hand. Um, let me see if I can get to it. Uh, 
I want to I want to get to that raised hand. Yes, um, Aaron, tell me. Did you raise your hand on purpose? Oh no, I am sorry. I did raise it on, on not on, on purpose, so I'm sorry. Oh, you didn't raise it on purpose. I'm like, oh, look, there's a raised hand. Oh, no worries. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right, I'll let you go. <laughs> I actually don't even know how you raised your hand, <laughs> so I can't even tell others to raise their hands if they. Uh, um. <laughs> on the bottom, if you touch the screen on the bottom, there's like a little bar that gives you several choices. One oh, of them is to raise hand. yes. Awesome. Okay. Well, yep. thank okay. you for chiming in because now we know. <laughs> All right. Great job so far. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I'm gonna, so getting back to it, and I can't see myself, I, I assume you can all see me. Um, so where, oh, I, we were talking about rewriting uh, beliefs. So rewriting our beliefs is absolutely doable. They're just a little bit more pervasive than your, you know, kind of run of the mill thoughts. And, oops, I need to go back to, let me see. Yeah, okay. So. Memories and trauma are the other deeper level of um, pre-programmed aspects of our being. Um, so this can be childhood trauma, it can be adult trauma, of course, but it can also be ancestral trauma. Um, I have been working on this with clients where, you know, we're finding that there are certain things that are so profound, and this is not just me saying it, you know, this is also the work of people, of the epigeneticists that are showing that, uh, and, uh, trauma experienced, you know, two, three, four generations, they've mapped that at least four generations are visible, are absolutely traceable. And so if we go, if you go as far back as your, you know, parents, grandparents, great grandparents, so the fourth generation back from you, their experiences can absolutely be showing up in your biology. And so, you know, this is where things like, you know, I've had clients uh, whose ancestors lived through the Holocaust. And, you know, that traumatic experience, even if they themselves weren't born during the Holocaust, the trauma of their ancestors is very much still alive in their cells. And so, we work actively on helping them heal that ancestral wound and and removing that imprint in their cells of the the emotional shock the 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 trauma the grief imagine all of uh, uh, imagine that experience in my in my personal case my ancestral wound that has completely shaped my life was uh, my grandmother uh, being uh, orphaned at three years old begging in the streets and then you know, being picked up and, you know, shamed for a big portion of her life or a significant portion of her life. And so, you know, these are things that are not insignificant and they absolutely um, permeate our cells or vibrating in our cells. And um, the good news is that we can do something about it. So how we can conceptualize, oh, and as the thing that we start to notice is that as we shift beliefs and as we are able to heal those trauma, tra traumatic experience, traumatic memories, whether they're our own or ancestral, that we notice it in the quality of our feelings. We notice it in the overall mood, the overall environment in, in our state of being. So as we were talking about frequency, I don't want to stop on this slide for too long. This was developed by Dr. David Hawkins. And so what he mapped was the, he was able to measure the frequency of different emotional states and the corresponding life view, or if you wanna think of it as the, the type of thoughts or, or the thought perspective that corresponds to that emotion. And so at the very bottom, uh, a consciousness of victimization is one where the person has a life view that life is miserable, that life is all about suffering. And the emotion that uh, a person in that state feels is profound shame, humiliation, and then if we move up you know, in frequency, somebody who's believing that life is evil or bad, 
has a sense of blame or perhaps guilt, um, but blaming others for what's happening. Then we move into life is hopeless and a feeling of apathy and or despair uh, corresponding to that. And you know, we keep moving up. You know, if we look the frequencies as they go up. Then, you know, a life view that holds that life is hard and antagonistic, that it's a battle, that, you know, you're doing battle with life. You know, there can be a lot of anger and hate in that, um, in that, in that vibration. Um, and then as we keep moving further up, we start to find that, you know, we might move into life is possible, that there's actually possibility and there's a sense of encouragement or that it, life is satisfactory. And so we feel more, more trusting and more, more neutral. Um, if we move up into life, life is hopeful, then we might have some more optimism and feel more generally optimistic about life. What's really interesting is that if you keep going up in the frequency, we find that between the life view that life is benign and that life is complete, where we're in a state of feeling mostly joy and love and serenity. This is where um, some researchers have measured that DNA healing can happen in at this frequency. So that when we are in a state of love, joy, serenity, that we are able to um, quickly heal almost, you know, what one might miraculously call miraculous healing of DNA. So my favorite story to tell, and let me see if I have another thought. Um, yeah, I guess the point that it, just to make on this slide is the more positive the thought, obviously, the higher the frequency of the emotion, the higher frequency of vibration. And so um, this is also going to co correlate with something we'll talk about later when it comes to light. So my favorite story about um, the essentially almost miraculous spontaneous healing that can happen is Anita Morjani's. And some of you may be familiar with Anita Morjani. She is one of my favorite people. This is a book that she wrote, Dying to Be Me. And um, what Anita Morjani's story is about was that she was diagnosed with stage four lymphoma. Um, she, by, when she got diagnosed, she had been someone who was maniacal about healthy eating. She was vegetarian. She was big into juicing. She did everything right, everything by the book, which is again, you know, to, to the point that food is important and it can get you going. It can give you a really tangible sense of your power over your body, and yet it's not all. It's not the end all be all. So when Anita Morjani got diagnosed with stage four cancer, she did everything she could do. She did um, Ayurveda. She did Chinese medicine. She did chemotherapy and radiation. She did everything that she could do. And she went into organ failure. She was in the hospital. She slipped into a coma. Uh, and if you know, when you go into organ failure, essentially it means you're dying from cancer. And she was skin and bone. She had tumors, um, you know, oozing and popping out of her skin. And um, she was essentially dying and her family was gathering. And as she was dying, she essentially slipped into a near-death experience where she had complete understanding of her cancer. And she realized that it was her profound fear and not just general, well, fear of everything as she describes in her book, but she was especially deeply afraid of cancer and dying of cancer. And it was the, the fear that had been fueling her cancer all along. And, you know, the book is extraordinary. I absolutely recommend you reading it um, because, you know, you know the punchline already that she doesn't die um, because she wrote the book. But, you know, she comes back from her near-death experience with the understanding that it was her, her fear. And in that near-death experience, she also has access to that infinite love, infinite joy. I'm just going to go back to the previous page. She, she describes this total state of peace, of bliss, of joy, of 
expansive love that she already is, that we all are, that we all have access to at all times. And she comes back with this vibration of absolute love, joy, peace, bliss back into her body that was just a few hours ago dying of cancer. And she bucks, comes back joyful and she says, I totally get it. I'm not going to die. I know I'm meant to be here to share my message. And her doctors warned her family, hey, don't get your hopes up because this sometimes happens. You know, they're dying and then, you know, they wake up, they have all this energy and they just come back to say goodbye and then they're gone. And she's telling her doctors, no, 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 I'm going to be fine. I'm going to be fine. And within five days, her tumors were noticeably shrinking. And they still kept her in the hospital as she was gaining weight. And she, you know, they still did all of these tests and they kept telling her, you still have cancer, you still have cancer. And she was just like, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm going to be fine. I, I know I'm going to be fine. And she walked out of the hospital totally cancer free. And so she now, this is the thing that she does. So Anita Morjani is not exceptional. She just had access to this space that we all have access to. And she, essentially came back to share it <laughs> with us and tell us we too can do this. So in a nutshell, every thought, every belief, and every memory carries a frequency. You feel those frequencies as emotion. You vibrate those frequencies in every single cell of your body. That's how you are being in your body. And you do have the choice to change them. And so you can read Anita Morjani's book, you can practice affirmations, you can do EFT, uh, you can use hypnosis, you can use Psyche. There are lots of different energy tools and psych psychology and energy modalities. Of course, I practice a lot of these things. Oh, I'm skipping ahead. Um, but so let's talk about your writing exercise. So let me just skip ahead for a moment in case you need help just to finish that thought. So in my Vibrant Body Thriving Life program, we do start diving into the mindset that's creating your health as it is today and help you start creating a mindset for thriving, a new identity for health um, and a new state of being for health. But when stuff is a whole lot deeper, like Holocaust, like trauma, like, you know, all kinds of trauma that I've been working with. You know, that's where I work with my clients in private sessions. So let's get back to your writing exercise. So in your handout, um, there are a number, there's a whole page almost for writing space. And what I want to invite you to do is to spend some time on this where I'm going to move from the slide in a couple minutes um, to get into the alchemy of light and see if anybody has questions. But this is a, a writing exercise that I really, really want to encourage you to spend some time with, um, not just the next couple minutes. So you're going to sit with what is something that you want to shift in your health? What is a health condition? Or maybe it's just your overall health that you can focus on. But if there's a, a particular health condition, then focus on that. So you're first going to write, what are some of the symptoms that you would rather not have? And list everything that you can think of. Then connect with how you feel about having these symptoms, how you feel about having this health condition. What are the emotions you have about it? Then what are some of the thoughts? And I deliberately, even though thoughts are kind of precursors to feelings, sometimes we can more clearly identify our feelings than pinpoint the exact thoughts. So I left the, I put the thoughts third on purpose. So what are some of the thoughts that you hear yourself have about your health issue? Or maybe even what are some of the things you say? You know, things like I have a bad back. I have a bum knee. You know, my joints are bad. My family has this. I have you know, high cholesterol. I have, insert the blank, you know, all of, uh, fill in the blank, sorry. Um, I, uh, all of these I blank are really powerful statements. Remember your cells are listening. So what thoughts do you have? And then you can dive deeper into the beliefs you have about your health and your symptoms, you know? 
especially when things get really intense, you can ask yourself, do I actually believe that this is curable? And an easier way to identify beliefs is to say, a part of me believes blank. So a part of me believes that this is never going to go away. I know that was the case for me with my health issues. There was a part of me that just thought this is never, ever going to shift. You know, a, a part of me is attached to uh, this idea that my family has these health issues. And then life experiences that might tie into the story. Is there, you know, trauma? Is there events in your childhood? And another way to think about this, and this is where I started to find correlation between life experiences and my health issues, was to look at the emotions. So if you look at the emotions that you're feeling about your health issues, ask yourself, where else in my life do I feel this way? If you're angry about your health situation, what else are you angry in life about? Or what life experience has made you angry? You know, I've shared this uh, quite widely in my blog and videos that when I had severe cystic acne, I had profound shame um, about going out in public. I, I hated myself when I looked in the mirror, so I had intense shame and intense self-hatred. And when I started to look at my life experiences, and, um, and I also have shared this widely, you know, having been the victim of a sexual assault, I realized, oh, that was the precursor of the shame and the self-hatred because of getting myself in that situation, because of, of course I was blaming myself. That was the precursor of the acne. And in fact, when I realized that connection, the acne hadn't started until after that event. So this, as you can see, this is a deep, deep exercise where you can find out a lot about what is going on with your health that is way beyond the food that you're eating because you may, like Anita Morjani, you may be doing everything right. And so there's more to it than what's at the surface. Okay, so this exercise merits you spending some time, so we're gonna move on. And again, as I was saying before, if you need my help, I'd be delighted to chat with you and I'll tell you about a free consultation that I do, I'll tell, tell you about it at the end. Because I am about to talk about something I have never talked about before. I, I have to confess, I'm a little bit nervous about going here, but I'm gonna go here because I committed to it. The alchemy of light. These are tools that I have been using for myself for 20 years. I, I became a student of metaphysics when I was, <laughs> so more than 20 years, because I became a student of metaphysics when I was a teenager, and <laughs> that was more than 20 years ago. Um, so the alchemy of light, um, we've been talking about frequency, right? And how frequency is the rate, the speed at which a wave moves. So everything in this field of the quantum world we live in, everything is energy, everything has a frequency. Solid matter has a very slow, very, uh, very slow frequency, which makes the energy very dense that we can touch it, we can knock on it, right? The faster the movement of that wave, the greater the frequency, the faster it moves. We can't necessarily touch it like sound, or even faster, much, 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 much faster, like light. So, you know, solid, very slow, a little bit faster, sound, thought, also faster, um, and then light is infinitely faster. So when we start talking about light and matter and quantum physics and metaphysics, of course, we have to start with Einstein, because, of course, this is where we all learn that energy equals matter times the speed of light squared, right? And so obviously 
we can, you know, extrapolate matter and say, all right, energy is your body multiplied by the speed of light squared. And if we apply a little math and a little physics and we move the speed of light out of the right side and into the left side, you know, we know that our body is energy slowed down by the speed of light divided by the speed of light so slow, so slow, so slow, but it's still energy. And so it stands to reason that if we use light to accelerate the energy in the body, that we're going to raise the frequency of the body, raise the rate of vibration of the body. And so I hope you're all following me here with this very basic rudimentary understanding of physics and metaphysics, quantum physics, etc. So what is light? And this is a little couple pictures I took just today with a little, um, a little prism that I have right here, this beautiful little prism. And so, of course, we know that white light is all of the visible spectrum of light and that when we run white light through a prism, such as the flash from my, my phone, camera you can see all the little separations of light in the itty bitty little especially if you see at the bottom you can see the little rainbow light separating into the different um you know colored light the different wavelengths of that light so we know that prisms help to shape light and to separate light into what we can see into the visible colors of light and so we also know and we see that there's prisms, there's geometry everywhere in nature from the ones that we can see like crystals or you know, some of the most beautiful prisms um, in, in nature. I surround myself with crystals and you know, hold them and meditate on them because again, our intention, our, our thoughts, our intention can channel who we're being. And so we can meditate on prisms, we can meditate on light. So I'm going to keep going on this to help, you know, to take us somewhere on this thought of using light and uh, geometry and prisms to accelerate the frequency of vibration of our body. There's also re the recent kind of new mathematics of fractal geometry. Fractal mathematics are these phenomenal mathematicians that are finding that there are patterns everywhere in nature. And so the fractal that you see at the top left is a computer generated fractal. So, fractal. so this is an equation, a mathematical equation that gets charted and repeated over and over and over. And it starts to form essentially a shape, you know, that we, that might be reminiscent of a seashell or the whirlpool of water or tides or um, fjords, you know, in Norway. So what these mathematicians are finding is that there are patterns of geometry that repeat over and over and over and over again in the universe from the macrocosm of the universe all the way down to the atom. And we can also see fractals in things like, um, oh, the name of this broccoli is, uh, oh, this, oh, what's the name of this broccoli? It has um, Romanesco, Romanesco broccoli. It's not that common, but it, you may have seen it at the grocery store where you see that it has a geometrical shape, a geometrical pattern, and every single one of those little nubby things when you approach them on the microscope and you magnify them, they're repeating exactly the same pattern. So we see fractals in nature, we see prisms in nature, we see the geometry in nature, and sometimes we see it at, you know, on a visible scale, and sometimes we can't see it. But the fact is that these uh, geometrical shapes, these prisms are helping to shape light, helping to conduct light in a particular way. So in this case, you know, the, the geometry, the, the prism of the Romanesco uh, broccoli is shaping white light and refracting white light so that it reflects back green to us. So we see it as green. Now, the other fun thing that is, has been um, shared in the last decade or so is the work of um, Dr. Emoto from Japan, who started uh, photographing under the microscope crystals of water and finding that 
um, different intentions, different frequencies of words, of intentions uh, would shape the crystals of water differently. And so, and he actually has really interesting before and after pictures where he might take a drop of water from a contaminated well and um, freeze it take a picture of it and there wasn't really any sort of geometrical shape to it and it actually looked like a blob almost like you know cancer cell um, but then if the intention of prayer or hope or happiness or telling telling it you're beautiful with genuine intention was dedicated to that water and then they froze the water a miracle a miracle yes it was a miracle a crystal would be would take shape and so, um, you know, he documented this extensively. Of course, there are a lot of Dr. Emoto detractors, some people who, you know, the skeptics that say, oh, you know, the pseudoscience of Dr. Emoto. And so they set out to, you know, disprove him and try to replicate his experiments. And of course, they didn't work. Why? Because quantum physics shows us that the observer shapes the field. So if you're a cynic, trying to prove that Dr. Emoto is a whack, a quack, <laughs> guess what your water is going to do? Guess what the intention is going to be? So the thing here in this example is that the, genuine of the, the, the genuineness of your intention and the genuineness of saying, okay, I, I am going to move into practicing these affirmations or I'm, I'm going to uh, practice gratitude or I'm gonna, going to pray or I'm going to work on my emotions. It has to be genuine. That the kind of, um, you can't trick the game. You can't be cynical about it and say, all right, well, let's do these affirmations see if they work. It's the vibration, the, the underlying vibration, the, the underlying attitude and the intention that is really going to be um, overriding uh, or, you know, dictating really the tone of what you're doing. So just as with water, we also see with plants that the intention projected to plants also shapes the fractals in plants. And so this was an experiment where in Ikea, they placed these two girls, convinced Ikea to have these two plants and to have visitors bully one of the plants and tell the one plant nasty things and tell the other plant uh, beautiful words and praise and so, and watered them the same. But then the, the plants obviously responded differently and it kind of breaks your heart to see the bullied plant and to imagine the impact of the vibration that it was receiving. So just as you can shape water and affect the energy of plants, you also can reshape the fractals of your biology through your intention. You absolutely can reshape the fractals of your biology. You can shape your cells. You now know that you can direct your cells and you can reshape the fractals of your biology and raise your frequency. So as you can do this, you know, with water, with plants, with intention, you can also attune to light to shift your frequency. And so what I'm gonna invite you, I'm gonna just share with you a few slides with different colors. I'm gonna tell you about the different rays, the different color properties, and invite you to sit in the color that you're gonna be seeing and invite the intentions of the color to touch you or move you or inspire you and see how you feel them. You know, I'm not saying that you're gonna feel, you know, earth shattering shifts. <laughs> I'm just gonna explain to you how, how uh, different colored light has different frequency and with these frequencies, they have a, a, different, um, a different effect. So we're gonna start with what's called the gold ruby ray, or, you know, in plain English, an orange light. So an orange light has the, the quality of um, generativity or uh, creativity. It's also a color that can stimulate, you know, um, fertility, that can stimulate um, supply. It is the color associated with um, 
let's call it the opulence of life, the opulence of life force within you. So when you meditate on a, an orange color, on that gold ruby blend, um, you're tuning to an energy that has a frequency of creativity, of generating, of supply, of um, maximizing of fertility. And in fact, it's the, the color that matches the second chakra, which is the chakra of creativity and fertility as well. So you can ask yourself, is this a color that perhaps you are drawn to? Or maybe if, is it a color that maybe you, you reject? Because sometimes rejecting a color can be a sign of imbalance, a sign of um, you know, not being open to a certain vibration or a certain frequent frequency or having judgments about the things that, you know, might be associated with that light. So uh, a gold ruby light is phenomenal for boosting creativity, uh, fertility, boosting supply. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to the next color. Gold light. Um, Coming from that orange, this gold doesn't look quite as gold, but if you imagine a bright yellow gold light, gold light is uh, an uplifting light. It's um, not coincidentally kind of the, the color, the hue that we also associate with the sunlight that you know just does have a yellow quality to it. It's uplifting, it um, has a uh, positivity effect, it boosts optimism, it boosts brightness, and even kind of that sense of uh, being smart and bright and intelligent. So it also, again, goes hand in hand with optimism and a sense of agency, of power, of, of strength. So gold light can be a phenomenal antidepressant. It can, you know, be very mood lifting. It's also the color of the third chakra, the solar plexus chakra, which is again, the, the chakra of uh, personal power. So when we surround ourselves with that gold light, that yellow light, it does help to uh, boost that sense of, again, kind of smarts, optimism, positivity, you know, bright outcome, and our, our sense of agency. The next color light is green light. And so green light, kind of not coincidentally, green light is, as it is the color predominant in nature, um, it's also the wavelength of light that um, has a quality of boosting healing. Um, it, it promotes serenity, it promote cal promotes calmness. Um, and in that way, it also kind of allows for the space of allowing for physical healing to take place. It's great when hospitals have a lot of green, <laughs> just because you have a little bit of that vibration, because otherwise hospitals don't tend to have a whole lot that boosts well-being. Um, but a green light also uh, fuels a sense of connectedness, of and especially connectedness to nature. And so this is one of the effects also of what's called in Japan foresting. If you know, people, and these are fascinating studies that they're doing, people walking through forests, and the very um, measurable healing effect that it has to surround yourself with plants, to walk through forests, um, and to be in that frequency of green, and of course, in the frequency of nature. Um, so meditating on green, green is also uh, the color of the heart chakra, and I'm also not um, accidentally uh, wearing green. I chose to wear green and blue for this. So green is the color of the heart chakra, very healing to the heart and healing to the physical body. The next color also relates to the heart chakra, but kind of on what we would call a higher octave in metaphysics. So on a higher dimension of the heart chakra, Rose light is the light that is soothing to the heart. It's kind of the light of the divine feminine. You can imagine rose light as being the quality of the divine mother, the most benevolent, loving, compassionate, nurturing mother that you could have that just, you know, surrounds you in her embrace and, you know, brings healing to your heart. It can be incredibly healing for profound trauma, 
from deep wounds of the heart. So, so the rose light has kind of that quality of divine, higher level love, fraternity, doting, healing, that sort of energy. So meditating on, on rose light or using rose quartz, I have my big honk of rose quartz on my desk all the time to tune into that frequency of that shade of rose in my healing work for the heart. Then the next light is blue light. Um, and I know we're coming up on time soon, so don't worry, we're gonna be done at around 8.30. So blue light is, um, is the light of equanimity. It's the light of balance and truth. It is uh, a light, you, you know, and it's the color of the sky, you know, meditating on the blue of the sky, looking out at the blue at the sky is a way to tune into that wavelength that brings you clarity, that brings you wisdom, and again, equanimity, that gives you certainty. Um, it can help you communicate. <laughs> so this is, here's my blue. Um, blue is also the color of the heart, uh, the throat chakra. Um, so <laughs> this is just popping to mind right now. I don't know, there might be someone on the call today that's working on something with their throat. So the heart chakra um, benefits from blue. So anything that, not heart, excuse me, throat chakra benefits from blue. And anything that is in your throat um, will benefit from blue. So that's just a different spin that I wasn't planning on talking about tonight, but it just came out. Maybe somebody needs to listen to hear that. Um, so blue light for communication, for equanimity. Then violet light. Uh, also one of my favorites to work with, um, the color of amethyst. Um, I've also got my amethyst quartz to tune into the color of violet light. Um, violet light is the light of forgiveness, of compassion, of transmutation. Transmutation is a big metaphysical concept where transmutation has to do with shifting things quickly uh, from one, from the negative polarity to the positive polarity. And so um, violet light can help you with complex problems, the kinds of problems that you may not see solution to. And so Using amethyst, using violet light, meditating on violet light can be a powerful way to, you know, surround that problem, surround that issue um, with some light that will help to shift it to a higher vibration um, and, and sometimes really clearly show you what needs to be done. And then white light. So white light is essentially all of them. It was really hard to find a way to convey white light on, uh, on the screen, on the slide. So white light is the compendium of them, and it is also seen as the ray of ascension, of course, of purity, of higher consciousness, of oneness. And so meditating on white light, and you can close your eyes and imagine yourself being bathed by white light. If you don't know what light to work on, you can just choose white light because it has them all. And this is a wonderful kind of energy practice to do on a daily basis. Is, you know, you can do it in the shower, you know, as you're feeling the trickling of the shower over your head, imagining white light, you know, fueling that cleansing of your body cleansing of your mind, cleansing of your emotions, cleansing of your energy body, of all of the, if you know that your thoughts are wavelengths that are bumping against everybody else, imagine everybody else's brain waves bumping against you and how your cells are, you know, kind of reverberating with the brain waves of everyone around you and the news and social media and all of that crap that is, you know, constantly coming at you. So yes, you have power over your thoughts and the vibration that you bring into your cells, but you know, unless you clean yourself of all of that junk that you're picking up from the street, you're just going to be carrying it with you and making it your own. So it's one of the easiest things to get rid of is through intentionally saying, nah, that crap is mine. I'm going to wash it off with the shower of the water. And as I'm feeling it, I'm going to 
visualize all of that being washed away with white light and you can visualize the white light washing you inside and out inside your body outside of your body cleaning your space cleaning your house taking it all the way down the drains for it to be recycled in the water treatment plant <laughs> or maybe composted in your um your uh, uh oh my gosh what's it called when you don't when you have a uh, i can't think of it anyway the, your your septic in your septic so white light and as I mentioned, the chakras all have a, a wavelength, a, a vibration. The chakras are energy centers in your body. They each have a wavelength that corresponds to a color. Um, and uh, yeah, we kind of touched on those um, since we're running out of time. I'm just going to skip ahead. If you have questions, um, you can absolutely write me about these. So in a nutshell, different color light has different frequencies. We absolutely know that. And as you focus on that light, you begin to attune yourself to that vibration. It's just like, imagine a tuning fork, tuning an instrument. You strike the tuning fork and the instrument starts to reverberate with the note of the tuning fork. It's the same thing. You're using your intention, you're using your mind, you're using your saw your consciousness the power of your consciousness to tune to a much 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 higher frequency than the one you're vibrating in so meditating on light using light tools even though we can't see them and they take faith to a great extent they are so much faster than anything you can eat that they're going to accelerate everything all right so in conclusion, you master the alchemy of your physical body to create lasting radiant health through the alchemy of food, detoxification, digestion, managing inflammation, and optimal metabolism. These are all super important, powerful tools. But most importantly, through the alchemy of yourself, through mastering the symphony of your thoughts and beliefs that are expressed through the vibration of your emotions, you are vibrating in your body 24-7. You're not eating 24 seven, but you're vibrating in your body 24 seven. And that is what is shaping your health. What is shaping your physical body and you have mastery. You can have mastery over it. And you can choose to speed it up and have some fun with the alchemy of light. So we are pretty much at 8.30 exactly. You can absolutely do this. I'd love to help if you need help. Some of you are doing a great job already, and I hope that the handout and the notes you took are just enough to keep you going. But if you do want help, I'm thrilled to offer a complimentary discovery session. It's an hour. You can book it straight through my website. Go to thrivewithmorella.com forward slash contact, and um, you can book an hour with me, and we'll dive into what's going on for you and how we might be able to work on it. And, you know, I can give you ideas. You can read the book by Anita Morjani. Definitely listen to my interview with Bruce Lipton. And um, yeah, feel free to raise your hand if anybody, I'm going to stop the sharing. And if anybody uh, has a question, feel free to raise your hand or send me an email. Um, happy to, to stay on for a couple more minutes, but I did say it was going to be 90 minutes. So if you have to go, no hard feelings, you can go. And uh, if not, I'll stay here for a couple of minutes if people have questions. So Aaron said to raise your hand at the bottom of the screen, there's a way to raise your hand. And I see people are going. Bye-bye if you have to go. Sleep tight. Sweet dreams. <laughs>